Let's talk about multi-agent architectures. We talked a lot about architectures and now I think it's time to dig into Agentic AI. So we have a thing called agent and all of you have already heard about it, but what is an agent? So an agent is basically a microservice for non-AI people. A microservice that can receive a request and the request is usually gonna be a prompt or a request from a different microservice and we need to do something with this data, all right? We need to return some data to the person who requested this data. So how are we gonna do this? Obviously we have our LLM, and in this case, it's an external service. So our LLM is hosted outside our service, okay? So this microservice is detached from this LLM. And before going to the LLM, you would usually go to a database for some data retrieval, and it's a vector database, so you're going to get some context that you're later going to use for as a context for your LLM, and then basically you give back the data. Agents can also have their LLMs and databases within the same server, but this is not scalable because, for example, in microservices, you wouldn't put two different microservices into one EC2 container. You would split them so that it's easier to scale them both when needed. Now, why are we talking about multi-agent architectures? Because single agents are not that powerful nowadays. So let's take a look at the difference. This was a single agent that had to perform various actions and its context limit or context window is limited. What is a context window? Context window is basically how many tokens or letters you can feed it. So if you have a very long question, then it's not going to be able to process all of that. I think you remember this limitation from the earlier versions of ChatGPT. Your, your text had a limitation, but nowadays it's much, much bigger. While with multiple agents, we are already separating the concerns. So this looks more like a microservice architecture, meaning we not only are distributing our context window. So the first agent that gets a response from a request from the user is going to do something and then it's going to forward its knowledge into the second agent. And then the second agent also gets a much less context window and it is able to do some rack. So for example, it can retrieve some data from the web, from the database on, and then pass it to an LLM or vice versa. And what are basically the advantages of this architecture, of the multi-agent architecture? Well, first, suppression of concerns. Every agent has a different role. So for example, this agent was responsible for cleaning up the data, and then the next data or the next agent is responsible for gathering and organizing the data. That's why it's also going out to the web and to the database. And the most important point is scalability. So for example, as I said, if we pass all the data into one agent, it also has to store it in the memory. And then on every sub subsequent request, it basically takes the stuff that it has in the memory and then has to feed it back into its context window. And then it's going to grow exponentially. That's why multi-agent architectures, for example, like ChatGPT now, ChatGPT version four and higher, or even three, I believe 3.5, have a multi-agent architectures and they're therefore much more powerful. Now we're gonna talk about different architecture types and how you would come across them. So the first, the most popular architecture would be the hierarchical vertical architecture. You can either call that this or just vertical architecture. So what is it? Let's say you get a prompt from the user and you would normally have an agent who is the orchestrator, all right? In the microservices world, it's basically kind of a gateway, okay? So the gateway is going to forward the request to different types of agents and each agent is responsible for different things. For example, this one is responsible for getting some historical data. Of course, it can also has its own LLM, let's say here, but I just didn't put it there. This one gets something from the web and it's responsible for cleaning up the data or summarizing the data. And then finally, this agent is responsible for giving a final decision. Now, how do we know which agents to contact? Well, the orchestrator also has its own LLM, so it's going to contact it first and then decide which agents it needs. So this is how flexible it is. And agents are pretty smart. So if we take a look at the web agent class, so let's say this agent 
is the web a no actually this one is the web agent that specifically goes out to the web it's basically a microservice and that has a single endpoint and it's basically going to execute fake web search obviously it's going to be fake so it's going to retrieve some data from the content or or content from the web rather and then uh, now we don't have a summarizer but let's imagine we also have its own llm here then it's also going to contact its own llm that's also hosted on a different machine and then gather the data and then pass to the orchestrator. And finally, the orchestrator is going to return this data back. By the way, guys, if you like this video so far, make sure to smash like and don't forget to subscribe. And also I have a server for you from the company called Sonar. You probably already used one of their products called SonarCube and they're conducting a survey for developers in order to see how AI is affecting our day-to-day -day job. Most of you are already using some AI tooling for your work. And this survey is exactly for this, to see the impact of AI. And the first 500 completers or people who complete the survey are going to get a special hat from SonarCube. Kind of looks really cool in my opinion, but keep in mind that it's only restricted to North America and Europe for logistical reasons, but nevertheless, try it out and that would help the community a lot. And we're gonna move forward. So the second architecture is gonna be the human in a loop architecture. As you can see, it's pretty much the same, can also be the orchestrator here. The only difference is that we're gonna have a human here. Why do we have a human? Well, some domains, for example, medical domain, governmental domain, and let's say even YouTube. YouTube is like a crucial part of our lives, right? So if AI starts closing the channels down because it thinks that some of the channels are suspicious, um, half of the YouTube is gonna be wiped out. That's why there are people working at YouTube who get the answer from LLMs, from agentic AI, and then they are able to respond manually with a yes, this channel is just a spam, or no, this channel is not a spam, it's legit. That's why sometimes we have a this kind of a human within the loop. Let's say one of the agents did, actually needs an approval from human. And you're gonna come across this a lot, especially in the medical, as I said, fields where the doctor's approval is also needed or somewhere in the government where uh, social matters are affected. Now the next one will be the network architecture or the swarm architecture. And for example, you can, run into this one when drones or unmanned vehicles are working together like taxis or drones that are flying in the in the sky so basically you're going to have some input from the user but as you can see the difference here is that we don't have an orchestrator anymore so all of them are main characters so to say and all of the agents are able to talk to each other now you might ask how do we even decide something? Because we have four agents and how are we going to come to a decision? Well, within these kind of architectures, so within the Swarm architecture, sometimes we use the design pattern called shared tools. Yeah, um, Agent AI has its own design patterns. And shared tools is basically a shared database like this one, for example, and which is connected to this agent. And all the other agents, as soon as they make a decision, they're going to post it to this agent. And this agent is going to save the decisions of other agents within here. And what do I mean by decision? It can be a confidence score, it can be a voting decision. Basically, at the end of the day, we need to come to a consensus. For example, we have multiple drones, and all of those drones, let's say, have two agents within. And the agents are going to vote whether which drone are we're going to follow and which direction to fly to right so this is one of those architectures and obviously the agents can do web queries well not in the case of drones maybe but they definitely have some LLMs running inside it um, mining the geospatial data for example all right and the last architecture which is also one of those popular ones is a sequential architecture sequential architecture is going to be most popular within the how is it called ET etl extraction transformation and um, I forgot, but it's uh, it's coming up. This pattern is coming up a lot in data mining. Let's say we have one agent that's uh, taking the user input or some kind of a data from a database, and we're going to clean it up. Let's say we're going to remove the unnecessary content from it. Then this knowledge is going to be passed to a different agent, and different agent is going to take this content as an input, and it's going to contact the vector database 
and do some decisions here. Let's say it's going to prettify the text, it's going to improve the text, and then this improved text is going to be passed from one agent to another. Basically, you get the idea, and at the end, we're passing the data, or the final data, out. So as you can see, these agents are relying on each other. And as you can imagine, this is going to be much slower, for example, compared to an orchestrator, because, because orchestrator can orchestrate or it can ship the messages at the same time asynchronously. So here, let's say here at the same time, and then gather the data here uh, much faster. While in this architecture, in the sequential architecture, uh, this agent has to wait for an answer from uh, this agent. And this agent has to wait for an answer from this agent. So again, it doesn't fit like real time use cases when you need speed. Uh, but it perfectly fits for uh, data mining and data extraction and so on where the user doesn't have to wait or can wait so long. All right, guys, if you liked the video, smash like and I'm going to see you in the next one.